Hey, Latin 3. Um, we are coming up toward the end. That's right, the end of all the things that I need to tell you. <laughs> Once we get to the end, then from there on out, it's just practice, 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 reading all the time. Can't wait. But um, I've been warning you guys I need to tell you about conditions, okay? Um, because there are things about conditions that you need to know that you don't know, and that might honestly seem not true, right? I mean, because conditions themselves are not inherently complicated. They don't seem like a Latin 3 topic necessarily. Because, well, for one, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, if-then statements. We've been seeing if-then statements as long as we've been reading. I mean, way back in, like, I don't know, chapter 3 or 4 of your textbook, we had if-then statements. So why, if we've had them so long, do we need to talk about conditions, if then statements, like why, why do we need to like even address this? I mean, they don't seem like they have anything super special about them. Well, in the most basic sense, they don't. However, what we do need to talk about is this bit down here. When conditions are real versus unreal, or alternatively, you might see factual versus counterfactual, or um, sometimes they also use the term imaginary for the unreal or counterfactual. Because yes, Yes, conditions can be unreal, they can be counterfactual, they can be imaginary. You follow? Don't worry if you don't. Let me give you some examples. So check this out, all right? That is a condition, right? It starts with an if, and uh, do keep in mind that it also might show up with a nisi, not just a C, right? It could be if or if not. But when you look at what that says, it says, if uh, the cats uh, are biting my feet, then I'm weeping, all right? And there's no special grammar here that you guys wouldn't already know about. I just used a bunch of good old, like, Latin 1 style present tense verbs. Um, and that's because if this thing is happening, then the other thing is happening. As simple as that, right? Uh, they've got, you know, tiny, sharp teeth. And it hurts when they bite your feet. And they love biting feet. So if the cats are biting my feet, then I'm weeping. Okay? But... <clears throat> That's a, that is a, a true or factual condition, but it is possible to word a condition such that it is not true or not factual. So check this one out. It says, if the cats were biting my feet, then I would be weeping. Now, I've used all the exact same vocab words, but you'll notice I have changed my verbs, right? I have my verbs up here underlined in blue. They are, you know present tense, they are active, indicative, different persons, but you know, it's all good because I have different subjects. And then down here, I've made them subjunctive. And that's the difference between what we consider like a real versus an unreal, right? Something that moves in purely to the hypothetical, which is I have made these subjunctive. And now I'm saying if they were biting my feet, then I would be weeping. And the whole point of, of phrasing it that way, guys, is because right now my cats are, are definitely not biting my feet. I'm in my classroom by myself filming a video about grammar. There's no cats biting my feet right now. But if they were, I would be weeping. All right? So it's still a present tense idea, um, but it's not actually happening right now. And by phrasing it that way, either in Latin by using the subjunctive or in English by, you know, putting a were in front of my biting and a would in front of my weeping, then I have implied that it is not actually happening. The condition is still true um, because, you know, if you fulfill this condition, then you get a result. But um, just because it is true doesn't mean it's actually happening and you can phrase it in such a way that implies that. Now, you might also have noticed a little bit of a tricky thing here, right? I said this is, you know, present tense, right? Those verbs are present tense. It's a present condition. Uh, you might have noticed something weird down here, though. Still a present condition, but those verbs are not present tense. Those are imperfect subjunctives. So let's uh, unfold this a little bit. So here's a, a table that shows you the basic breakdown of how um, our conditions are organized, just like uh, participles, just like infinitives, just like subordinate clauses in general, these can happen in different tenses. You can have present tense uh, conditions, past tense conditions, and future tense conditions. So uh, if you're in the present, it's pretty simple. You're going to have two present indicatives as long as it's real. 
But the counterintuitive thing is that if it's unreal, you won't use present subjunctives. You're going to use imperfect subjunctives, like I just did in that example. And you notice I used a were with the biting and a would with the weeping. Okay. Um, with the past tense, um, if it's indicative, theoretically it could be um, uh, any past tense. Although most likely it's going to be uh, imperfect or, or pluperfect indicatives that you're using there. Oh, and I should probably give a caveat. This is usually two presents. Sometimes you can sub in a perfect. Depends what you're trying to say. Um, yeah, usually this is going to be uh, imperfects and pluperfects. Um, uh, but if it is uh, counterfactual or unreal, it's going to be two pluperfect subjunctives. And this is the way you're going to translate it, had and would have. All right? Um, and I'll, of course, show you examples of that, too. And then the future down here, you're going to have two future indicatives. Now, I just wrote future that does also include the future perfect. In fact, this is one of the spots where you're most likely to see a future perfect. Uh, so it might be two futures or a future perfect in a future, but future indicatives in some way or other. But you can't have future subjunctives because they don't exist. So if you see it in the unreal or counterfactual, it's going to be two present subjunctives. I know that seems a little weird. Let me show you guys some more examples of actual conditions. I've got a few more written up here. Okay. So if we look at this one over here, all right, it says uh, uh, if Luke had eaten all the food or had, you know, gobbled down all the food, then Leia was angry. All right. Um, now, I phrase this in the past. It might be a little weird to think about conditions in the past because you would think, well, it's in the past. Don't you already know? But sometimes you don't, right? You know, I mean, for instance, I went out of town this past weekend, and this is a thing that it is possible for me to not know. And it is also real, right? Because if he had done this thing, then she was unhappy about it. Um, I don't know if he did, but it's entirely possible, maybe even likely. That said, you are much more likely to be doing, uh, at least in my experience, your uh, past tense conditions in the hypothetical because very oftentimes you're talking about things that would have happened as opposed to things that literally did so you know it might be something like this um, you know if Leia had been angry then she would have peed in my boots all right and I'm implying that didn't happen so she must not have been angry because because she didn't she didn't pee in my boots right but cats are like that so again it's a true condition even if it's unreal because if this had happened, then this would have happened, all right? And yeah, when you're dealing with the unreal conditions, I do very often find that they're in the past because you're kind of talking about a hypothetical that didn't come to be. And in terms of you know, thinking about it that way, of hypotheticals that didn't come to be, you can kind of see how this is in some ways related to the last video I did. It is uh, itself related to the potential subjunctive. One of the things that the subjunctive is good for when you're doing independent clauses is showing an unfulfilled potential, and that's kind of what an unreal condition is about. It's an unfulfilled potential. That's why you can have two subjunctives instead of having to have like a subordinate subjunctive and then like a main clause indicative. All right. Um, let me give you guys a future example before we leave off. Um, now, the future, I will warn you guys, if you're you know, seeing this in a textbook or if you see notes for it in some text that we're reading in the future, they do give the future a special name um, instead of just calling it real or, counter, uh, real or factual, unreal, counterfactual. They call the real one the future more vivid. I don't know, because reasons. Um, and so uh, here I've got my, uh, my future perfect and my future. If uh, you give the cats treats, they will be very happy, all right? I know I didn't technically translate this as a future perfect, but in English, we don't really use the future perfect for that, even though in Latin they do. In English, we would just say it like I said it. If you give the cats treats, they will be very happy. Very much a future more vivid. It is real. This is a thing that you know people might do because the cats are cute and you want to give them treats. Um, and when you give them treats, they're super happy, even though um, our cats are kind of weird and they don't really know what to do with treats. Um, Luke likes to gobble them down and then steal them from Leia, but, you know. Um, and then Leia wants to steal hers from Luke, but she never finishes eating even her own? I don't know. But still, they love them. So if you give them treats, they will be very happy. All right? 
Now compare that to uh, this one over here, right? So this is my future less vivid. This is the unreal version of the future. And yes, they do call it the future less vivid. I'm not making that up. All right, you can see already that I've got some junctive verbs here, but they're in the present tense, but still this is about the future. So what this says is if the cats should fall into the toilet, I, I know modern flush toilets didn't exist back then, so I had to like do my best on the, the right word for toilet, but if the cats should fall into the toilet, it, uh, it would be necessary for me to wash them, if they should. Right? And by throwing that should in there, I'm implying that it won't happen. But, it, but if it should happen, then I would have to do this. Although in truth, this example is a little bit more wishful thinking because honestly, I'm just tired of giving them baths. <sighs> if, only, if only this were really a future less vivid. But you know, I'm going to keep phrasing it that way and maybe it won't happen anymore. All right, uh, I'm going to get this posted and I will see you guys in a few hours.